Hi everybody, it's Flat Cap Cafe Racer. Before we get started with today's video, I just wanted to tell my, one of my subscribers, Bob Lynch, a big thank you for sending me this great Moto Guzzi jacket to go with my Moto Guzzi. I'm going to call it the Penguin, I think. But it fits great. I may have to wait till it gets a little bit warmer before I can use it. Thanks again, Bob. I don't think most viewers care that much about the background uh, of the people they're watching. I think it is important to know a little bit about the motorcycle background of the people you're investing your time to watch. And that's what this video is about. So I'm gonna give you some of my back, motorcycle riding background history, and I'm gonna peg it to some of the, the jobs I've had. It kinda helps me keep track of the time frame. So stay tuned. I got my start riding motorcycles when I was about 10 or 11 years old. And I had an older brother <coughs> and his friends, they were building uh, mini bikes in the early 1960s, but they weren't the kind of mini bikes you're probably used to seeing now. They were bicycle frames with lawnmower engines. And they'd build them, and of course, after they built them, they wanted to race them. Since I was only about 10 or 11 at the time, and I was a lot lighter than they were, I got to ride their mini bikes. If they wanted to win, they put me on it because I was so much lighter than they were. So that's where I got my start. I don't think my family even owned the camera at the time, so I don't have any pictures of those mini bikes. I'm going to throw up some pictures as we go along in this, and they're going to be the exact pictures you can tell, or they're going to be something similar to what we use. But the mini bikes we rode, were belt drive and they did not have any brakes. So we wore out a lot of shoes. When my brother turned 16, he got a motorcycle. He got a Harley Davidson 250 Sprint, I believe it was an SS. It was, it was fast. And, and when I was about 11, I was a little, still a little short. So he, he let me ride it around the yard. So the way I'd have to ride the bike, he, He'd help put it in gear, because I couldn't pull the clutch in. But, we get the clutch, I could hold it, then I'd have my foot up on a five gallon bucket turned upside down. And I could ride it around the yard, as long as I come back to stop where the bucket was. And he also needed to be there to help me pull in the clutch. So, it wasn't real pretty, but that was my first my first rides on a real motorcycle. When I turned 16, I was able to get my first motorcycle. And it was a 1970, it was new, Kawasaki A7 Avenger. It was a 350cc motorcycle, rotary valve. Uh, I'll throw up a picture here of what it looks like, um, the actual picture of it. And, uh, but it was really cool, it's 42, 42 horsepower, and I used to drag race on and off the strip with that. Uh, used to beat the Hondas pretty badly. Uh, everything up to a Honda 750. And uh, I could beat a Honda 750 an eighth of my mom, but not in a quarter if they knew how to ride. But I won a few trophies along the way. Some du dusty old trophies up here at the drag strip. And that was so long ago that at the drag strip at that time, they did flags and they give you spots. So I used to run against all the motorcycles, then I'd run against the uh, cars for top eliminator. And I could never beat any of the, the big wheelie barred cars because I couldn't even hear my engine run. Uh, it, was, it was very difficult, but uh, that was when I was 16. Between my uh, junior and senior year in high school, I went to work for my uncle up in St. Louis. He had run a filling station, I, I was pumping gas. And one hot summer afternoon, I was in a hurry to get home, uh, back to his apartment, and I was riding my Kawasaki A7 Avenger again. It's the last ride with me. And uh, I went, I was going on to the Interstate 70 at Lucas and Hunt. I think I can get a picture of that, the way it looks now anyway. And it, it kind of curls, the ramp kind of curls down and you get on. So I was picking up some speed going downhill 
and I hit the greasy middle of the road and the bike slipped out. But it kept slipping out and I saw something coming up the off ramp. And it was, I couldn't tell it was big and it was red. I didn't, I didn't know exactly what it was. But uh, anyway, I was sliding and sliding and I hit the, there was a divider, about a two foot divider between the off ramp and on ramp. And I hit the, the divider and the motorcycle stayed on the correct side of the road, but it flung me into the in front of the big 18 wheeler that was coming up. And I bounced off of it like a BB and uh, knocked me out cold. I wasn't, uh, I woke up in the ambulance and I still had my, I had wire rim, rim glasses on and uh, I had my helmet, I had an Arthur Flumer three quarter helmet on. And that Arthur Flumer helmet, uh, after I saw it, after a little bit, I saw that helmet and it looked like a windshield had been cracked, the, the whole thing. Well, anyway, it knocked, I hit that truck so hard that it knocked the lenses out of my glasses, the whole lenses out. I still had the wire frames on my face, that's why I couldn't see. That was that was a pretty big ding. So uh, after that, uh, I'm going to do something a little bit safer, steady my mom and dad's nerves just a little bit because they, they had told them that I was dying up there because I was, I was pretty much like a big stinger. I was, uh, was like paralyzed for a while. But I quickly recovered and within six months, I bought a Kawasaki, a 1970 Kawasaki Red and White Trail Boss, the one with the four gears low and the four gears high. And I went to, the, when I was recovering, I went to the motocross track and I was watching them. And the, while they were doing the motocross, I'm going, man, they don't hit, they're not hitting those jumps very hard. They're not, they're not, uh, they're not going very fast. I said, I can do better than that. So I got the trail boss, figuring I was already faster than they did. I just made a couple, about 30 minutes around the uh, local softball field, just running it. And I said, I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> well, I went out to the, I went out to the motocross track, and they ran, I think, three motos at the time. And I was in a 100 cc class, and in 100 cc class, it was pretty much all 100, all 100 cc bikes, about mine, were Hadakas. I think they were rats or something like that. So there were about 30 of us lined up, and as we were going and lining up, I'm going, okay. This is, I'm, I'm really good at the drag strip starts, so I can be pretty good at the dirt starts. Unfortunately for me, I was. And all 30 of us were heading down to the first turn. And the first turn, I think it was like three bikes wide. Well, some of the folks did make it and some of them crashed, some of them fell. And I might have run over one or two. So I finished up all three motos and I got, I went up to get my, I'll show you my little mental, little trophy I got for that. It's a little, <laughs> it's been busted so many times, I don't know. Here, here it is. Uh, it was a, for a second place, I think, uh, for motocross and uh, for the day, I won second place. When I went up to get the trophy, uh, they looked like they were pissed. I didn't, I didn't know, I'm like, I'm not very old, I don't know can't read people's facial expressions. Well, they gave me my trophy and they asked me, but really kind of told me, please don't come back. Uh, all the riders and the parents there don't want you to come back because they think you're a bit mental because you run over a lot of people. To be honest, I did probably run over a few more at, in those other motos, so they might have been right. Okay, the story continues. Um, after a little bit, I got, uh, I had, I was taking my car and going and looking for motorcycles because my kind of motocross career was at the end. And, uh, and on one icy day I went and uh, was coming back from motorcycle dealership to look and I flipped and told them my car. I think at that point in time, my mom and dad were kind of concerned about me and, and uh, my dad gave me his car if I'd uh, quit riding motorcycles. So I kept his car for a while, it was a really nice car. 
and uh, I just couldn't stand it for any longer. So I gave him his car back, and uh, then I got a 1973 Kawasaki S2A. Like most people uh, uh, during that period of time, and maybe even today, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I know what I didn't want to do. So I packed up my all of my belongings, loaded them in a, a TV tube case back in the old days when TVs had tubes. And I packed them all in that. That was my suitcases. I put them on my Kawasaki, rode my Kawasaki out 1,000 miles to Denver, Colorado, where one of my friends was at. I think I was out there probably one weekend and almost I ran off the road and a motorcycle was dangling off the cliff. But even that, they had actually had road racing out there. And I just had to do me some road racing. So I went to the, uh, started road racing that summer, uh, summer of 1974 as it was, with my Kawasaki out there. And uh, it's out at Woody Creek, out at, towards Aspen, Colorado, right towards that area. And uh, it was back in the push start days when you push start your motorcycles. Well, I could, I could run like a deer and I could always get a good push start. But unfortunately, uh, a lot of the racers out there came from, you know, motorcycle magazines like Cycle and Cycle Guide, and, you know, they actually knew how to ride. So usually I'd lead going into the first turn, maybe two, and I'd run off the track. I think I probably crashed conservatively, and most weekends I'd probably crashed two or three times. So we were racing pretty much every weekend, I crashed two or three times. And a lot of times I was riding the bike from Denver to As out past Aspen. So that was a pretty nice ride. And sometimes the bike would be all banged up, headlight ripped off or something like that. I did crash quite often. And I think most of the racers and a lot of the spectators were actually scared of me. Uh, I've actually seen them pick up their cameras and run when I would come around the turn. So I spent, the, I spent the summer spending all my money out there, and at the end of the summer, I was broke. The motorcycle was broke <laughs> and uh, sore, so I headed back home. Just before we move off from that, uh, I did go back to that track 48 years later, uh, this last past August with my one nephews, and we rode, and I went back to the track, and uh, they let us walk around it. Uh, I think I'd been better off if I hadn't told them that I used to race there and how I used to race, because they didn't let me ride the bike on it. So when I got home, my motorcycle was broke, like I said, and I was broke. And uh, my dad, being the gentleman he was, said, son, how would you like to go to college? <laughs> and I'm going, okay. Uh, so he took me down to the Army Recruiting Station. As the beginning of the all volunteer army in 1974. So I signed up, joined the uh, army in 1974, spent three years or 1,096 days in there. Uh, I, I went to a uh, station in Germany and I, I bought a Harley Davidson, what was it, a 250? What do they call it? It was a two stroke 250, it's an army, Armichi. Uh, had a chrome bore on it. It was a pretty nice little bike actually and it would not run very fast but I found that if I went up into the mountains and raced downhill I could keep up with a lot of the Porsches racing downhill. Uh, unfortunately I lost my driver's license once or twice uh, for racing in the motor pool but other than that it's pretty uneventful time in Germany. I enjoyed that 250. I left it over there. I often wonder how, where it's at. I think I got a picture and I'm going to share with you here is a, we had a reunion of all those army folks and it was, gee, it must have been 35 years later and uh, we got together. We just, it, was a, it was a good time. I enjoyed that. Well, when I got back out of the army, it was 1977 and um, Kawasaki was still broke. <laughs> My dad wasn't going to fix it and uh, I re reluctantly got a job. I wasn't looking for one. but you know how relatives are. They found me one 
And despite my answering all the questions no in the interview process, they hired me. And that was as a soil surveyor for the Soil Conservation Service. And I did that for a little bit. Then I met my wife, who's now my wife. We got married and uh, had to get a little bit more responsible job. So um, I got a job with the Missouri Highway Patrol as a, uh, what do you call them, weight inspectors. I don't know what you call them where you're at. But basically you set out in the interstate way out far nowhere and weigh trucks when they come across for violations or equipment violations. Well, I had a job there in the uh, weight station. I took the midnight shift so I could go to college during the day. Because like I said, my dad, you want to go to college, get in the military, and you can get your GI benefits. So I went to college during the day and worked at the uh, weight station at night. And uh, actually did pretty good. The only kind of motorcycle I, riding I was doing, I was riding my uh, Triumph XS750. Um, I bought that instead of the GS750, which I still regret. And the uh, only time I rode it really was just, you know, back and forth to work and nothing, nothing special, no racing or anything. It wasn't a race bike. So about 1981, I, I graduated college and um, I had taken ROTC, which is a reserve officer training school, uh, as a cadet in there. So uh, my wife and I decided we'd give the military a try. Uh, this time as an officer, so I went in 1982. I went into the military, the Air Force, as a Minuteman missile launch officer, and I was stationed uh, at Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri, and pulled probably 200 something alerts as a crew member, and also I did um, I was a missile missile launch instructor there. From from that. Um, they pulled me into the ground launch cruise missile. And maybe none of you knew, know about that, but the ground launch cruise missile was stationed over in Europe. It was, the, it was a nuclear weapon. It was a tactical nuclear weapon. So we went to Belgium and I spent uh, a year in Belgium. And then after the year in Belgium, I came back to uh, Tucson, Arizona to be a, a missile instructor. At that point in time, I started collecting motorcycles. I was going through motorcycles at a pretty good clip there for a while. Uh, and I, I keep them. And uh, one of my students came through one day and he had a 1985 RZ350 uh, Kenny Robs replica. And I decided that uh, I would help him sell that. It just so happens that nobody bought it, so I had I felt obligated to buy it. So I bought the RZ350, and sure enough, you know, I was able to go up and do some road racing again. Now, the last time I was up road racing was probably 15 years before this, and this time I was very much better, <laughs> meaning I didn't crash, and it was a lot smoother and did a much better job racing that little RZ350. It was basically stock except for a two may exhaust system. It might run 130 miles an hour, about 55 horsepower, but it was a really good bike. It was easy on everything, and um, I used to race it, and I did really well with it. I, I got a lot of, I, most of the time it was either first, second, or third, and by the end of the year, I'd actually qualified to go to, the, at the end of the year, go to the Daytona, and the amateur CCS is what they call it, and race there. And uh, I knew that wasn't going to happen because one, I didn't have the money to do that. I didn't have the time, nor was the military very, they didn't, they didn't really sponsor racing. So that was out of the question. And that's one of the things I really wish I'd have got to do is go out and go on the Daytona, the high bank. That would have been cool. One of the things, one of the other things I picked up as a, kind of an additional duty, I became a uh, motorcycle safety instructor at the base, and we taught not only base people, but civilian people. So we would do that, I would do that. I did that for a year or two, and I found that being a motorcycle safety instructor really helped me become a much better rider, and it really did help me when I was road racing. And um, I, I had to credit that to improving my riding skills quite a bit. I, even though I had taken a lot of courses, 
over the years, uh, different courses, I found that being an instructor really helped me out as far as my writing. As you know, <clears throat> in 1990, the, it was about the time the Cold War ended, you know, when the, the wall in Berlin came down. And, and uh, I want to tell you something that it probably doesn't sound right, but uh, since I was involved with the nuclear weapons for so long and as an instructor and battle planner and launch officer, you know, I have, I did well uh, in that field, but I'm not, it may, this is what might strike you funny is I'm not a, I'm not a big proponent of nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, they scare me. Uh, you know, I've seen machines make, have glitches and people make errors and leaders make bad decisions. So, uh, you know, some of the things I've seen in there scared, scared the hell out of me. And I was involved with it for a while, a, a good long while. But one of the things, once I left there, I, I went to, um, in 1990, I went to a thing called Education with Industry. And uh, in Education with Industry, I was at Sikorsky Aircraft, and I got to price aircraft there. And I was at, out in, in Connecticut. And it was pretty cold in Connecticut, too. And uh, I was doing my riding. I'd ride with, uh, I'd ride my Harley Davidson Sportster out there, and I had my, uh, my BMW out there, uh, R90S, and I'd go into the shop sometimes, and I was wearing electric gear, and they'd go like, what's all this electric gear? And so <laughs> that's the only way I can ride when it's 25, 26 degrees, because they, they were looking at me strange because I was riding. <laughs> but uh, once I moved from um, Stratford, Connecticut, we moved to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, and at Wright-Patterson, I was a manufacturing uh, and quality uh, officer and I you know went, I was in charge of buying stuff like the B, uh, C-17 trainers and things like that simulators and things for the F-15 and F-16 and uh, I think I kept my K-75S through there then I let it go it it wasn't just a it wasn't a it was a good looking motorcycle I think I got a picture of it around here somewhere and oh there it is. It was a good looking motorcycle, but it just didn't have any character or charm to it. So I sold that one and I kept the Harley for a little bit longer. I think I kept the Harley for about 10 years. In 1996, I got the opportunity, as one of my uh, jobs I had while I was in the Air Force too, I was working in a treaty office as a and the START Treaty, Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, and the INF Treaty to des destroy the uh, our, our the SS-20s and on for the Russians, and also the ground launch cruise missile on the American side. START Treaty, we were destroying the B-52s on our side, and they were destroying the back uh, uh, bear bombers on their side. So in 1996, I got to go to Russia. And that was pretty cool. Went there on a diplomatic passport, and and I got uh, exposed to all of the first time I've ever heard of the Urals at that point in time. And I go, man, I like those sidecars because they would, you know, they're running up and down the road with, you know, four people on them and hay bales and you know sacks and everything like that. And that yeah, looked pretty neat. So when I got back, I ended up getting a little MZ. Uh, 500 Gaspin sidecar and I kept that for a lot of years. But, uh, once once I got back out of the Air Force um, you know I got to I, I did a video on the kid in the candy bar it was time for me to get out of the Air Force uh, I wasn't you know i had been in, involved with the nuclear weapons and instructor and battle planner and stuff like that for you know years and I decided it was time to retire out of the Air Force and I retired out of the Air Force in 1997, I think, and I went, uh, I went into the motorcycle shop, the BMW shop, and they were building, they had an old shop then, and the guy asked me, the owner, he says, how would you like to be my sales manager? I go, well, I'm getting out of the Air Force, so I need a job. He says, 
And I looked at the other guys there, and he had another guy who was a sales manager. I said, what's he going to do? He, well, he's going to go back to, he's going to go back to school. And I said, okay, I can do that. I can give that a try. I said, but I have never sold anything. Oh, you'll be fine. I said, I don't think I've ever done is bought motorcycles. So he hired me. Uh, I, I got out of the Air Force on a Friday, I think. On a Saturday morning, I went in to the shop a little early. I was supposed to start. And he opened up the door and let me in. We talked for a little while, and about 9 o'clock, he opened the, uh, the doors to the shop. And, you know, people started coming in, and, and it's kind of like pointing me to it. So, you know, I was scared for the first week I was there that somebody would actually buy something because I didn't know how to sell it to them. But I did figure that out, and we were, he was building a, at the same time. He had a brand new shop that he was building, and it was real nice, you know, real nice shop. And currently, it's where they're at right now. I'll try to pop up, a, if I haven't already, put up a shot of that. So I took that, and um, I learned how to sell the motorcycles pretty well. We went to the new shop, and turns out uh, we went from being like, BMW shop on sales from like 130 or 40 to we were in the top 15. Top 15. So and that was pretty good. So at the end of the year, uh, BMW, I didn't know this, BMW had a uh, Edelweiss 10 day Alpine tour. Uh, it was all expensive pay, all expensive, everything was paid for except for the gas for a trip to uh, Europe, you know, and ride around Germany, Austria, Northern Italy and such. And, uh, and we got to do that, and that was great. I really, I really did enjoy that. I got, uh, I got to ride the RT, and I got to ride as the, they, they just come out with the four, the four cylinder, uh, what was it, uh, KRS or something like that. But it was, it was a new bike. I got to ride it up to Gross Glockner in the snow. The snow was on the side of the road. And we had a good time. We didn't, like I said, we didn't have to pay for anything. But that's my, I was a sales manager for, B, for BMW, Triumph, and MZs at the time. And um, I, li I liked selling the bikes. And most of the BMW owners were okay, but there's, you know, there are some of those BMW owners are kind of like they were pretty arrogant and, you know, throwing around money and, you know, how much money they had. And they kind of ticked me off. I didn't like those folks. I'd sell them motorcycles, but I didn't care for them. So I stayed as a sales manager for a couple of years. And as you can guess, uh, you know, working in a motorcycle shop kind of ruins a hobby as a you know, for your hobby. If that's your favorite hobby, that kind of kind of ruined that for me. So, uh, I started looking for another job. Like I said, it it just uh, it took the passion out of it going and doing the work. Um, I didn't. I just didn't. I like selling motorcycles, but it, I didn't have a chance to ride. So I got a. I took a. Uh, they had a job. They advertised for uh, this. This. Uh, company it's an aerospace machine shop company it made aerospace parts and parts for IBM and um, and they were advertising for a quality assurance manager so I hopped down there and I walked into the on a, one cold day and not very many cold days in Tucson and I walked into where they were doing it um, you know, the place of business, competitive engineering. And there was about 30 people in there for this job. And probably 28 of them had more experience than I did. So the owner of the company told us everything about the company and then he arranged interviews. My interview was scheduled for Saturday morning at six o'clock, 0600 in the morning. I said, oh my. So I went in there, and he told us a little bit about the company, and he started asking questions as well. You read blueprints, and I say, of course, you know, you gotta be honest. I said, no. 
do you, have you done this or have you done that and go no I don't think I answered any of the questions yes so at the end of this he asked me uh, at the end of the interview he asked me well when can you start <laughs> and I looked at him kind of strange and I, didn't you hear any of my answers I said no to all your questions he says well, I know he says I'll hire somebody else for the quality manager but I want you to be the uh, production floor manager well, I don't know anything about CNC machines. I don't know anything about lathes. And I told him I didn't. But uh, they hired me for that. And I ended up working there for from 97 to 2003. And in that period of time, I went from production floor manager to that quality assurance manager because the guy they hired instead of me, they fired him and they put me in his place. Then they gave me the quality control function. Then they made me the, uh, see, I went to be the purchasing manager, then I went on to be the sales manager. So I ended up leaving that one after about six years, after there had been umpteen different layoffs and, and uh, the writing was on the wall that I was probably gonna be next. So I went in, uh, over to Raytheon Missile Systems. Well, before I got to Raytheon, I'd probably pretty much only had uh, one motorcycle at a time, you know, maybe maybe two um, you know I had two motorcycles then at, when I started working at Raytheon I started working as a uh, quality inspector actually I never did work as a quality inspector they they had a big meeting and they, they asked for any volunteers for this project to do this project and everybody was sitting on their hands and I'm 50 years old and you know I can't wait around forever to do stuff, so I put my little paw up and volunteered to take that job. And that job turned out to be, it was a high risk job, but uh, it turned out to be, I did, it worked out really well. And I got promoted several times over and, and I kept getting promoted. And I got to work as a uh, project manager uh, for SM3 on the Kinetic Warhead. Uh, the Kinetic Warhead, the SM3 was a, a missile designed to go up and get shot off of a Aegis cruiser goes up to intercept ICBMs in exo-atmosphere and kills them by kinetic war force, you know, it runs into them. And my piece was the Kinetic Warhead. So I was a manager there and I did that for about 10 years before I decided, Lynn and I decided to retire and move up to Boise, Idaho where my son was. But but during that time uh, that I was at Raytheon, that's when I, in 2011, uh, is when I started to do the land speed racing. When one of the guys was just talking out, out at the, what we call a road runner. And uh, we sit around on Sunday and a bunch of old guys shooting the crap and I said, hey, I, you know, you ought to go to Bonneville. And I'm going, yeah, I, I ought to do that. So in 2011, we loaded up and two of us went to Bonneville and we brought a crew of two and uh, and uh, that was the first time at Bonneville, and I, I thought that was going to be the only time. And I, I was pretty convinced of that, but the guy that went with me decided that he wanted to run something a little bit faster than a Thunderbird Sport, so he bought a Kawasaki uh, ZX1400, but it was the, it wasn't the fast model. It was, it was pretty fast, but it wasn't real fast. So we had to go back in 2013. And uh, I rode my, in 2011, I rode my 2009 Thruxton, and we went like 125 miles an hour, which is pretty fast. And the Thunderbird Sport went 123. So we went back in 2013, I brought my Thruxton, I think I put a fairing on it. The same fairing I'm, I'm using on everything else I used on the Thruxton R. And uh, we, went, we went faster, we went, I think, 134 miles an hour then one day he got sick the guy I went with he got sick and I was allowed to ride the uh, his bike so I got a video on that you got to watch that one I rode it like I stole it and uh, the back end was coming around to kiss the front end <laughs> in between the gears and it was it was pretty awesome I got the plaque up here on the wall I'll show you that it, uh, I got up to about, we rounded off to 180, it was 179.7 or something like that. 
and uh, I only got one ride on it and uh, and he came back but uh, then uh, like I said we moved up here to Boise Idaho uh, met Mr. Bill at one of the bike shows and then, and then I met Rabbit Roy at one of the vintage bike shows and, and same thing with George then we started riding together but uh, you know I brought I brought let's see the motorcycles I brought up here I'll show you a picture of those uh, they lasted for a while I didn't get anything when I first got up here to 2016 in 2016 I, I bought the uh, Thruxton R and I've been as you know got a video on some of the mods I've done over it over the past six years and 10,000 miles um, and I bought a 2017 Royal Enfield 500 and uh, I got my neighbor had a Honda 550 F1 I got that and uh, but sometime about 2016 after I got this Thrux Nar, Mr. Bill and I started drag racing and uh, I think I've drag raced had 94 races out there since 2016 and and on eight different bikes got a pretty good winning percentage there um, Mr. Bill also joined me in 2016 when we took three bikes out to uh, the Bonneville Salt Flats I ran three out there I ran the 2009 Thruxton with a red fairing and went 140 I ran the stock 2016 Thruxton R and it you know we were just running out of gearing out there for that I ran 130 131 miles an hour then I ran the ZX 1400R that I had bought for my buddy in Tucson I, we kinda went in on it a little bit before I left Tucson and and, it, and I just paid him a little bit of money for the difference and then I, I brought that up and that I ran in a lot of 190, mid 190s. I think the high speed I got was 196.7. And uh, for me, it wasn't a bike for me to ride around town on. It was not a, not a good bike. I took it to the drag strip. I think I got 144 miles an hour as fast as I got on a drag strip with that. Uh, I did pretty well uh, with, you know, with the mods on the Th Thruxt Nar. I went from high and eh, probably mid mid 12s to mid mid 11s with that and i think i've got about where i'm going to get with that so uh then i then i bought uh <laughs> then i bought some more bikes uh as i traded in i got rid of some of those four that i brought up there to get other bikes so uh bought a, a real uh, nice uh, 2021 uh, tiger 900 and I right after right before that a body BMW R9 T is 20 it's a, like a anniversary model and I used dolls into August of 2022 when both of those were stolen and with with my trailer there's a video out on that so since then I've replaced the uh, 2021 Tiger with a 2023 Tiger and I didn't I replaced the BMW with a uh, 2008 Moto Guzzi uh, Breva Sport, and I think probably if I'm totaling up over the years, I've had 27 motorcycles, and all probably all but nine of them have been new bikes, and uh, there's still a lot of bikes out there I want to want to get to. I don't know. I'm going to have enough time to get to them or not but uh, I still plan on doing some um, racing here I've got a schedule I'm going to be riding um, Rob Smith's uh, Rocket 3 it's a 260 horsepower Rocket 3 in August of 2023 out at Bonneville and I'm going to go for we hopefully we'll get finally get a record out there I've been out Bonneville uh, I've been out Bonneville, looks like it's been out there six times already, and I've made 44 runs down the salt, and uh, so coming up on the seventh time, probably get another seven or eight runs in there. So I'll be over 50 runs out of Bonneville too, so 
that's pretty good. Quite a bit of stuff. I keep all my drag racing slips and things like that and a lot of pictures and things from going out the Bonneville Salt Flats and the teams uh, where I used to road race and things like that. I still like to go back and do some road racing but I don't think I'm ever going to be able to do that because um, there's no place really close close by to do and I really don't have anything to road race. I guess I could do my Thruxton R but I might take one of these road racing uh, schools like Yamaha schools they have. I like to do that. Uh, there's still a lot of stuff I want to do, still some touring I want to do and hopefully the uh, this video will give you a kind of idea of <laughs> where my background and, and it may scare you off and I'll probably lose about three subscribers if people see this but I thought it'd be interesting at least to know although a long story know about whose videos you're watching and what their experience is because I have a lot of questions on people I watch I kinda you know and I did I did a video and I don't know if I'm gonna release it it's called the great pretenders I don't like pretenders so uh, you might you might get that from that video but thanks for watching if you stayed around this long you really are special <laughs> the little bus will be coming for you bye bye join me and my friends at flat cap cafe racer for riding and racing please subscribe